Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We almost made it through Hebrews chapter 4 last time. We've got one more verse to look at, verse 16, and then we'll move into chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Hebrews chapter 4. The Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com is the place where you can study the whole Bible with me, verse by verse, all the way from Genesis through Revelation, almost four complete series, using my audio Bible messages. And you choose which series, which book, which chapter, and click and listen. As I say often, bring your Bible, <clears throat> and a hunger for God's Word. That's all you need. Or just bring your Bible, even if you don't have a hunger for God's Word. Do it anyway. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Give God a taste. You'll get a hunger for His Word. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin reading in Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing, then, that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched <clears throat> with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We are to come boldly to the throne of Almighty God. And notice it is called the throne of grace. What is grace? Remember? God's goodness toward us that we do not deserve. When we approach God, we need to remember that we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to approach him. We don't deserve to open our mouths and ask for anything. Some people are mistaken about that command to come boldly before the throne of grace. Coming boldly to the throne of God is not an invitation to be disrespectful and demanding. Or to treat God like one of the boys. Makes my skin crawl when I see the word of faith teachers proclaim that we should approach the throne of God demanding. They're going to fall dead in the presence of God someday. Right before they're cast into hell. Many of them. They, they teach a false Jesus. They teach that Jesus never claimed to be a God, but they teach that Christians are God's little G. They're closer to the Mormons and the Hindus than they are to Orthodox Christianity. Coming boldly to the throne of God is not an invitation to be disrespectful and demanding. <clears throat> to, come, to come boldly. Before the throne of God means to come before the throne of God at all. At all. You don't come before God screaming and demanding that he do this or that as some of those disgraceful preachers are saying today. We must always come before God with humility. But we can come before God with confidence. 
because Jesus Christ is our mediator and he has paid for our sins and made us right with the Father. It is all about Jesus, you know. So look at 16 again. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can trust Jesus to help us. He paid for our sins. He knows what it's like to be a human. He knows all about all of our sins. But he still loves us, and he still wants us, and he still helps us. He gets God to show us mercy on the basis of his death on the cross. And that's why we should never ask, never hesitate to ask for forgiveness. Jesus will always be there to help us find mercy from God. Even during those times when we know that we know that we know we don't deserve it. And of course, the devil wants us to think that way. And, and, and it's true. It's true. We don't deserve forgiveness. So after you sin, you may think, I don't deserve to be forgiven. And you're right. You don't. And the devil may tell you, you're not worthy. Don't even ask for forgiveness. You're not worthy. Well, that's partially true. God says, it is true. You're not worthy. But ask for forgiveness anyway, because that's what God wants you to do. And God promises that he will forgive through his son, Jesus Christ, if you confess your sin. Do it when you feel unworthy. Do it when you're broken. You are unworthy. You should be broken. But do it anyway. Because that's what God wants you to do. The Bible says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. <clears throat> God is saying, let's put an end to our dispute. Let's be on the same side. I want that, you want that, and it can happen by you repenting and asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. Chapter 5. For every high priest taken among men is ordained for men in the things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? for he himself also is compassed with infirmity. The Old Testament high priest was human just like everybody else. And because he was human, with a sin nature, he was weak. And he had to confess his sin just like everyone else. The high priest, back in Old Testament days, knew what it was like to feel guilt. He had to humble himself and confess and bring the sin offerings just like everybody else. The office of high priest was very important and holy, ordained by God. But the man himself was no different than us, which is why he was able to sympathize with sinners who came to God for forgiveness. He knew what, he knew what that was like. Nevertheless, he still represented people before God. He was ordained by God and anointed by God to do that. That was his job. So in spite of his unworthiness, he would do it. Sympathetically, hopefully. Two and three together. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. For he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason of this, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So before the high priest could stand, 
in the gap between the people and God, he had to offer a sacrifice for himself. He had to be right with God himself before he could help others get right with God. You cannot give what you do not have. Consequently, his sin had to be removed before he could intercede for other sinners. And it works the same today. Before we can go to God in prayer on behalf of others, we have to be right with God ourselves. That means confessing all known sins and receiving forgiveness through Jesus Christ before we can help others. <clears throat> I am uh, battling a cold here, so I may have to interrupt myself. Verse 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee? As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You know, a high priest back in Old Testament days could not just start being a high priest on his own. Couldn't open up his own high priestly business. A man could not post an ad in the newspaper saying, introducing Mr. X, a new high priest, ready to reconcile sinners to God. It didn't work that way. The high priest had to be appointed by God. And likewise, God the Father appointed Jesus, his son, to be our high priest today in place of those Old Testament priests, which God Almighty set aside. There's only one way to God. And that is through the great high priest that the Father himself chose, and that would be his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't approach God through anyone else by any other means, but through the high priest who paid for your sins. Seven. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. And you can tell from this verse, and it's talking about Jesus, that Jesus' life here on earth was not an easy one. In another place, the Bible says he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. This world is not an easy place to live in especially if you're holy. I wouldn't trade holiness for anything. In fact, I wish I was holier because there's the joy and peace that comes from walking with the Lord. And yet, in a sinful world, you're not exactly Mr. or Mrs. Popular. Jesus did not have an easy time. And Jesus went through what we go through, which is why he completely sympathizes with us at all times. On the night he was betrayed, he prayed very hard with strong crying and tears, asking his father if it was possible for him to avoid the cross. But it wasn't possible because it was the only way to redeem sinners. So Jesus suffered just like you and I as Christians must suffer sometimes in the will of God to accomplish something that God wants us to accomplish. And often those reasons are known only to him. A few years ago, I heard a TV preacher, yeah, not surprising, a word of faith. God, these guys are absolute idiots. Like my dad used to say, nuttier than a fruitcake. 
Anyway, a few years ago, I heard one of their top guns on TV say something really stupid. He said, you cannot glorify God if you're suffering. You cannot glorify God if you're sick. You cannot glorify God if you are poor. He said it. And all the bobbleheads in the audience just bobbled their head up and down. Ain't I right? Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. You bet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm watching that and I'm thinking, you idiots, you fools, you morons. With the top moron up there saying such ridiculous things and you're bobbling your head in agreement. Compare what that dope says to Scripture. Compare what that liar, that deceiver is saying to Scripture. He's just trying to pad his pocketbook by getting you to send an offering and making false promises that you will never be poor, that you will never be sick, that you will never have trouble if you just send him offerings. So then you can be useful to God. See, this is all about God. Baloney has nothing in the world to do with God because it's a lie. You can't glorify God if you're suffering or if you're poor or if you're sick. Get some faith and you'll be healthy and wealthy. And part of that faith, the big part is to send me money. See, I'm at the top of this Ponzi scheme and I just rake in the doughs. I rake in the dough, I rake in the bucks. And you poor, I wish I'd give him a truth pill. And he'd say, and you poor, pathetic fools out there are buying this lie. Get yourself wealthy, get yourself healthy. Then you can glorify God. What an ignorant, unbelievable, unbiblical statement. You can't glorify God if you're suffering. What he should have said was living for Jesus when he doesn't jump like a genie and grant all your wishes will not impress a self-centered, worldly, materialistic person like me. That's what he should have said. He should have said, living for Jesus when he doesn't jump like a genie in a bottle and grant every single one of your wishes doesn't impress a self-centered, worldly, material, materialistic, false Christian like me. There's nothing in the world to do with Jesus or God's will or glorifying him. <clears throat> I don't care what someone like that says, living for Jesus when life is lousy reveals more faith in that suffering Christian's little finger than that dirty, rotten, filthy dog has in his entire soul. Jesus glorified God in his suffering. Hey, fool. Jesus glorified God in his sufferings. The apostle Peter knew, the Bible says, what type of death he would suffer at a relatively young age that would glorify God, being arrested, being crucified upside down. The Bible says, Peter knew what type of death he would suffer that would glorify God. Hmm. Hey, idiot. Open up the Bible. And you won't say such foolish things. Jesus glorified God and he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. You can't glorify God if you're in pain. You can't glorify God if you're poor. Really? Jesus had nothing but the clothes on his back. Guess he didn't glorify God. He was in a whole lot of pain and he wasn't feeling too good when he was shedding drops of blood 
in the garden. He was praying so hard under so much pressure. Hmm. Sorry, Jesus, guess you didn't glorify God, not according to these idiots. As I said, Peter glorified God, not just in his death, but in, in his sufferings. So did James, so did John, so did Andrew, so did Bartholomew, so did Judas, not Iscariot. So did Philip, so did James the last, so did Paul, so did Timothy, so did countless other martyrs in the last 2,000 plus years. And let me just say one more thing to back what I'm saying. The Bible says that Christians are to fill up. Watch this. The Bible says that Christians are to fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. That goes over like a lead balloon in Word of Faith meetings. Christians are to fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And by the way, if people knew their Bibles as well as they know the teachings of men, then they would realize that God says it's, it says that it, it's difficult times are some of the greatest times of spiritual growth. Suffering, God says don't despise the hard times. They're, they're the things that make you grow. And we know that God can do anything, so we ask, but sometimes he says no. And sometimes that means we must simply endure suffering in the will of God. Jesus, Jesus suffered in the will of God. Jesus suffered in the plan of God. Jesus suffered for us. And there was another reason Jesus suffered. Notice verse 8. Verse 8. <clears throat> Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. The sufferings of Jesus were actually a form of education for him. He learned firsthand about the sufferings one must endure at times to remain faithful to God in this fallen world. He learned that firsthand by experience. <clears throat> when people say, I know, how, I know how you feel, they don't always know how you feel. When Jesus says, I know how you feel, he really does. Nine. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. We can't earn salvation by obeying God. But if there is no obedience, then there is no salvation. Faith pleases God. Faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross saves our soul from hell. But I'm telling you what the Bible teaches over and over again, saving faith always results in a holy life, a life, a human being that has a desire to please the Lord. Called of God, verse 10, and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom... We have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Wow. Paul never would have been invited back to a lot of churches by telling the people in the audience that they were dull of hearing. That's so negative, Paul. Paulie. Shouldn't be so negative, Paulie. Don't you know you're making these people uncomfortable? Paul made a lot of people uncomfortable. So did Jesus. So does every true preacher of God. That's his business. But, like he says here, there was much more that could have been said about Jesus being our high priest, but it wouldn't pay because the readers wouldn't understand it anyway. 
And that's really not a knock on them. <clears throat> because under normal condition, under normal conditions, it takes time to grow spiritually. Of course, there does seem to be an issue with these people. Under normal conditions, it takes time to grow spiritually. So to say that you don't know everything that you know, that you should know, that's not a knock. Because I don't know everything that I should know, and I've been studying the Word of God 43 years. Many of you know what I'm talking about. But in the case of these people, the apostle makes it clear that they were spiritual sluggards. They were dogging it. It is normal to want a baby to grow to be an adult, but there is no way to speed up the process. Making a baby eat like a lumberjack won't cause him to become an adult in six months. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. We Christians learn and process what we learn a little at a time. Doesn't, it doesn't pay to try to force feed anyone spiritually. And that's why Paul was spoon feeding these people, basically. He was measuring the amount of truth that he was giving them. They're only going to grasp so much anyway. Let, let them chew on what, on what they've received. Let them assimilate it and then give them some more. That's what you do with a little baby, right? And that's why we have to Refrain from trying to force feed one another spiritually and force someone to be a more mature Christian than they really are. Don't force it. Just feed them. Give them the word of God. We have to be patient with each other and allow the Holy Spirit to mature us. And that takes time. Problem comes when professing Christians aren't interested in pure truth. They want to have their ears tickled. That's a different issue entirely. It's one thing to, to be grown in your walk with the Lord, which hopefully we all are in the process of doing. A little bit here, a little bit there. Taking the word of God here, taking the word of God there. This sticks out to you, that sticks out to you. It's a constant feeding, a constant growing, and you accept what you read. You accept what you're taught if it's based on the Word of God. That's normal. That's spiritual growth. That's becoming a, a mature adult Christian. The difference between that and, and being a lukewarm modern evangelical who doesn't want truth or roll their eyes when they hear truth because it's so old-fashioned, you know. <clears throat> anyway, let's move on to verse 12 quickly. For when... For the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of solid food. They were lagging behind. And you know, when it comes to spirituality and sanctification, if we're not progressing, then we are regressing. And that's what was happening to these Christians in the book of Hebrews, they were regressing. See? If we don't go ahead in our understanding of Jesus and in our understanding of the Word of God, we will most definitely go backwards. One thing is certain, we will not stand still, spiritually speaking. The, bo the moment that we stop progressing with Jesus, we start slipping away from Him, which is why we have to keep reading the Word of God, we have to keep praying, we have, to keep, we have to keep studying the Word of God. We have to keep learning the Word of God. It's through that we are sanctified and we progress. And I'm out of time. Don't forget, if you want to be a part of this ministry, you can be. Please don't forget, I have never been underwritten by a large church or denomination. For 33 years, this has been a faith ministry. I just give out the Word of God. Pray for me. Pray for God's Word. 
and click the donate button at the top of the front page at the Bible verse by verse .com and prayerfully give.